Hot Mike with Houston and Hogan features two radio professionals with over a hundred years of broadcasting experience between them. Dave Hogan and Randy Houston are both native Western North Carolinians whose rich voices have been heard in every glade, cove, and holler of Western North Carolina and East Tennessee during the last century, primarily on AM radio. And between the two of them, they've worked in just about every radio format, classic rock and roll, country, news talk, pop and big band, gospel and bluegrass. As you can imagine, these guys have tons of stories about the day-to-day of live radio and the interactions they've had with listeners and entertainers while they were immersed in, at the time, one of the most influential and informative mediums available. They both have crossed paths with some of the biggest names in the entertainment industry since the 1960s, and the time has come for them both to tell all. The information they disseminated, the entertainment they provided, and the advancement of commerce they promoted contributed to the growth of the mountain region of North Carolina. Those experiences will be featured in this podcast series. Check the subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts and ride down memory lane each week with Randy and Dave on Hot Mike with Houston and Hogan. Hello, everybody. I'm Randy Houston. And I'm Dave Hogan. And we are... Hot Mike with Houston and Hogan. Hey, you Welcome. mean this mic is fine? i got to be careful what I say. Every single <laughs> word is being recorded. You know, a lot of these politicians get caught with a hot mic. <laughs> and they didn't mean to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, friends, we're uh, tickled to death you joined us here on Hot Mike with Houston and Hogan. I'm Randy Houston, and that's Dave Hogan. And we are just old broadcast guys. We uh, first met up. In June of uh, 1993 is when we first started working together, formed a friendship and a respect for each other's broadcasting abilities, and we've stayed friends since then. We go to monthly lunches together and tell old radio stories. And some one of us had the brilliant idea of saying, you know, we ought to do a pot. We ought to record some of this stuff and do a podcast and that's what we're doing dave and i are going to be talking to you about our experiences of working together and uh and this whole crazy industry that he and i together have spent over a hundred years in and i must say i've never worked a day in my life i have laughed my way through over 50 years in radio and we laughed a lot together when we worked in uh, 1993, didn't we? Oh, that was a lot of fun in 1993. And, you know, prior to 1993, and we'll, as these podcasts develop, we'll talk about before 1993 when you and I got into the business in the 50s and 60s. And it was a whole lot different back in those days. And about the time you and I started working together is when radio started more automation and you know when i got into radio and you got into radio every dj you heard on the radio practically was live you could pick up the phone and you could call the disc jockey and make a request 24 7 yeah if it was a full-time radio station yeah but you know a lot of radio stations uh in the smaller towns were daytime only and the daytime would be Hours would fluctuate. They would change. And and another thing that I think is important to point out is that when you and I got into radio, the formats on radio stations were different than today. It was called block programming. Yeah. There would be an hour or two hours of country music, and then you would segue into pop music for a couple of hours. Then around noontime, you'd probably have a block of news and farm and sports news. And then in the afternoon, at least in my experience, I had a rock and roll show called a Teenage Platter Party starting at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when school was out. So as a result, we worked a lot of different music formats in the early years and and that was to our advantage because we learned music from all these different uh, formats and different genres of music. We had a man, I was working in Murphy at WKRK, 
And uh, his name was Red Schuyler. And Red was also a salesperson for the Cherokee Scout newspaper and uh, worked part-time for the radio station doing a program called Sundown with Red. And it was big band music. Well, he would get tied up sometimes with a sales call for the newspaper. And he would call me. He came on right after my rock and roll show with his big band show. He'd call me and say, Dave, I'm going to be late today or I can't make it today. Can you do my show for me? And he had this big stack of 33 and a third uh, RPM records of big band music. Glenn Gray and the Casaloma Orchestra and Glenn Miller's music and Swing and Sway with Sammy Kay and all these big bands. And so I got to do that show quite often. And so over the course of the day, and it was the same way when you first started at a small town radio station in Marshall, you would play gospel music, you'd play country music, you'd That's play right. rock and roll music, you'd play big band music, maybe all in the same day, along yeah. with doing some news along the way. That's right. Rip and read, we called it. <laughs> Rip that news copy off the AP and the UPI wire and run in there and read it cold and stumble over uh, <laughs> names that you never heard of. And mispronounce a bunch of them. <laughs> exactly. Rip read. Oh, changing the uh, teletype ribbon and, you know, making sure the teletype machine, because that was our network. That was our our key to the outside world came through that teletype machine to think about that in the internet now it's amazing and you know the advantage that we had if a radio station changed formats it, it, and later on I, I talked about the block programming and gradually radio stations started uh, becoming specialties in one area they'd be either, either a rock and roll station easy listening at one time, or uh, uh, if you lived up north, there'd be stations actually would play polka music all day. A station would specialize in a particular format. So the fact that you and I had experience in all these different music forms, if a station pl uh, changed formats, we could just, we could, we could work that format, whatever it was. So Maybe. when we had an opportunity in the 90s, 93, that you were talking about, yeah, to work at WISE in Asheville and simultaneously with WTZQ in Hendersonville. Yeah, our programs were on both stations. And we played a big variety of what we called uh, music from the Great American Songbook. Everything from Frank Sinatra to uh, Glenn Miller's big band music. The first first record I played on WISC, I remember the first record I played doing the morning show. Ah, yeah. It was the first day of summer. Yep. 1993. And you pulled out a Nat King Cole album. Roll out those lazy, hazy, <laughs> crazy days of summer. Man, I was so happy to hear that. I That was my first uh, job as a general manager. I'd been on the air and in sales at, uh, the station across town, 570 WWNC. Uh, I, I went to work there in 1977 and, uh, went into news and on air afternoon drive and was part of the crew that had the number one station in the nation in the eighties. And then I moved over to get some sales experience and those two careers, those two inside and outside uh, jobs and radio, uh, gave me the knowledge I needed to become a general manager. And that opportunity presented itself at WISC WTZQ. And along came, I was discussing with our plans with the owner one day, and he whipped out a letter to me. Uh, we were talking about what we're going to do about this morning show vacancy here. And he whipped out this letter from Dave Hogan and I read it right quick. And it said, uh, Ardell, congratulations on buying WISC WTZQ. I've often thought of returning to Asheville, North Carolina to retire. And if there's ever an opportunity to talk with you about, you know, blah, blah, blah. 
and uh, my eyes lit up because I had been listening to Dave Hogan on WSKY during the time that I was on WW and across town. I knew Dave Hogan. I used to go to the country shindigs that he promoted in the 60s at the uh, old Asheville City Auditorium and watch him MC concerts. And, uh, and I was just one of these days. One of these days, I'm going to do what that guy right there is doing. He's playing country music on the radio, and he's promoting up uh, these country concerts, and he's mingling with the Farron Youngs and the Jim Ed Browns and the Porter Wagners of the day, and he's introducing them on stage like they're old friends of his. And I'm going to do that one of these days. And I meandered my way and weasel and chiseled my way into the black skeevy hearts of those at WWNC. And I got to play some country music. Now, you mentioned the year 1977. And that's the year that I left Asheville and moved to Johnson City, Tennessee, and went to work for a radio station there, WJCW. Um. I started in Asheville in 1960. A lot of our listeners in the Asheville area will remember the name is Zeb Lee. Oh, Zeb yeah. was the owner of uh, WSKY. And previously, I had worked uh, first in Franklin and then Murphy and then up in West Jefferson, small towns here in western North Carolina. And if you were raised where I was raised, over in Andrews, near Andrews, in Cherokee County, in the far western part of the state, you thought uh, Asheville was New York City. It was the big city. (laughs) And your goal was to get a radio job in the big city. You're exactly right. And I was able to do that in 1960 with Zeb I was still a teenager then, and Zeb hired me, and I stayed with Zeb until 1977. And... I played country music for a lot of years there on WSKY, as well as some other types of music along the way. And then, um, and we were the only station in Western North Carolina at one time, believe it or not, that played a lot of country music. And the then, aforementioned WWNC was playing middle of the road uh, music at that time in the sixties and didn't switch to the country format until 69, I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure. So you guys were the, you, right. were, you were it. Through most of the 1960s, WSKY was the country music uh, radio station. Yes. And I was very fortunate to, uh, country music almost died during the rock and roll uh, era when uh, Elvis came along and and uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and all those big rock uh, stars. And country music kind of got shoved to the side, but it started coming back in the 1960s with people like Eddie Arnold and Patsy Cline and and those artists that attracted a wide range of listeners. And so I was very fortunate to play country music in the 60s and uh, meet a lot of the country music stars and promoted a lot of country music shows in Asheville at the Old City Auditorium and got personally acquainted with many of the country music artists. And I was thinking uh, just a few days ago, Hank Williams Jr. celebrated his, I don't know if he celebrated it, but he had his 73rd birthday. Hank Jr. Jr. Just a few days ago. And it's hard for me to believe that Hank Jr. is 73 years old because I remember sitting with Hank Williams Jr., at the old Holiday Inn restaurant on Tunnel Road in Asheville. There was a Holiday Inn there that had a restaurant. Late at night after he did a show at the auditorium. And I guess he would have been, you know, 22 or 3 or 4, somewhere very in his 20s. I have a watch, a wristwatch that Hank Jr. gave me, autographed by him in 1968. Wow. And, of course, he was just a kid then. I was too, matter of fact, (laughs) but it shows you how quickly time passes and how fortunate I was to meet so many of those people back in the day, as we say. And then you guys over at WNC had so much more power uh, than uh, 
WSKY. We were a thousand watt station on 1230, and WWNC had a better frequency, 570, 5,000 watts. So when you guys started playing country music, we just couldn't compete because you had such a strong signal and reached so many more people. So I got out of Dodge. I went over to Johnson City, <laughs> Tennessee, and I got me a job on a 5,000 watt radio station. And had a long run over there. WJCW in Johnson City, Tennessee. That's right. And then we came together, as you said, in 1993. Yeah. And we uh, had a great time during the decade of the 1990s playing uh, all kinds of music that appealed to an older audience. Well, as uh, I was saying before, as the newly appointed... W uh, I S E W T Z Q general manager. It was a welcome and rewarding feeling on uh, June twenty first there to uh, hear Dave Hogan working at uh, this radio station. I'm trying to make something out of. I said it's going <laughs> to happen. It's going to happen. We had a great time. We really did. We stayed together till two thousand. Mm-hmm. Was it? Yeah, the year two thousand. Yeah. And I had an opportunity, unexpected opportunity, to go back to Tennessee and play classic country music, which had a great attraction to me at that time because country music had matured to the point that there was a demand for what we term classic country. Johnny Cash, Merle Haggard. Patsy Klein, and the people that made country music famous again. And so I took that opportunity and moved back to Tennessee and uh, worked over there from uh, 2000 to uh, the time I retired in, in 2014. In that time that uh, you went back to Tennessee when uh, – when you left in 2000, I slid into your seat. I was the general manager and the morning guy there for a while. Um, enjoyed every minute of it. And, uh, and then, uh, things transpired so that I was able in 2002 to purchase the WTZQ part of that combo in Hendersonville. So I loaded up truck and I moved to Hendersonville and for the next six years or so, uh, ran and operated and did the morning show for WTZQ in Hendersonville. And in 08, I uh, moved away from there and, uh, kind of quasi semi retired from radio for just a short few months and realized, Oh, what a bum head thing I have done. And, uh, at that time in 08 with the, the economy at that time, Dave, it was tough to get back into radio. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about is opportunities in radio that, that we had that is, are not there today. Exactly. It's a different business altogether. Yeah. And so, uh, I did get back in and it was the lure of that classic country format that you spoke about. I am still in the business. Dave retired a few years back and, and I'm, I still keep trying to drag him back in, but, uh, I'm still going and I do a morning show on WHKP in Hendersonville. That's the station across town from the one I used to own. Yep. And so I'm happy over there and have been for 10 or 11 years now doing a morning show on a classic country station. And I, like I said, it's 10 or 11 years of doing that now. And I'm not tired of yet of Merle Haggard yet. <laughs> I'm not tired of Merle Haggard. <laughs> well, you know, you mentioned uh, working across the street from the competition. I've always had a feeling and it, and it, it turned out to be a good one that I'm not going to criticize my competition because I might want to go to work for them someday. <laughs> <laughs> well, it happened to me. <laughs> and that's happened to me, you know. I want to stay on good terms with my competitors. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, buddy, I just can't tell you how much I enjoy sitting here doing this and, and recording it. We've been doing it for a long time in our monthly lunches together, but now we are sitting in a studio 
and telling these radio stories. And we're going to keep on doing that. We, uh, we hope you enjoy them and we want you to, uh, push that subscribe button because every now and then we're going to drop a new episode on you and a new bunch of radio tales here on the show called hot Mike with Houston and Hogan. And boy, do we have some tales to tell? <laughs> yes, we do. We have some stories. Believe you me. Come back and join us. Thank you very much. Be sure to click the subscribe button and check back next week for another episode of Hot Mike with Randy Houston and Dave Hogan.